Well, the haters gonna hate, 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 and the fakers gonna fake, 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 baby. I'm just gonna make, 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 making luck, making luck. A dummy podcast. Do you wanna do um podcast? No. Okay. Well, there's no episode this week. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> we just made that call. Yeah. Jake didn't feel like it, so any hate mail should be directed towards him. Yeah, you gotta find me first, though. And if you win the raffle, maybe we'll do one next week. Yeah, so actually, uh, raffle winner this time, I've decided, is just gonna get to decide who I marry in Fire Emblem, because I'm going through another campaign of <laughs> Fire Emblem Fates, and normally I get married really quickly uh, to just get that child paralog thing going oh, but yeah. uh this time i'm keeping my options open so uh <laughs> probably camilla i'm not really sure anyway this doesn't you're a matter. very eligible bachelor in that game are you yeah cool yeah. just like sash from season 21 of survivor it's just like that the the biggest bachelor in new york or whatever i don't know yeah so Thanks. yeah uh welcome to making luck a dominion podcast yeah uh we are gonna talk about dominion uh, and we this time we're going to talk about uh, junking attacks, and specifically we're going to talk about what the role of junking is game by game, and uh, how to sort of look at junking uh, depending on what else is going on on the board. Usually, I use my eyes. Yeah, that's the best way, but sometimes you got to go by feel. Yeah. Uh, th- but before that, uh, last episode we talked. What the hell was last episode about? Um, <laughs> Was it uh, embargo? Embargo, right? <laughs> yeah. Last time we talked about embargo. Holy crap. Okay, you've got like you were petting oh the my dog, God. and you like got. That's amazing. Jeez, I have more of the dog's hair than my hair. Uh, right <laughs> That's now. That's amazing. Anyway, uh, uh, so uh, sorry, this episode is a day late. Yeah. Um. We I'm... we kind of got to Monday, and we both had you know yeah. some weekends where we accomplished well i accomplished a lot of things on the weekend i don't know what you did i did like absolutely nothing <laughs> okay and, yeah i've been i uh, really uh busy with work so i haven't been able to like work on dominion stuff and play dominion at work like i usually do i know that's uh, rough i know it sucks i actually <laughs> have to do work this is terrible <laughs> uh, what what happened this, there's got to be a law against this but <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we're sorry it's a day late. I don't have a legitimate excuse other than I just didn't prepare for the podcast like we were supposed to, so. We got to Monday and it was like, I mean, we could either kind of throw together the games with the kingdom and kind of go halfway on it, or we could delay a day and do a real good episode that we'd both be happy with, or we just do a mini-sode. Yeah, it was basically the choice we were looking at was, like, throw together a really quick episode and rush it and or like wait a day and actually do a decent episode and like more importantly the games we played with the kingdom from last episode like that was about embargo yeah and like we said embargo is more of a tactic than a strategy and so like it stands to reason that the video of those games can be uh important because you know you'll see a variety of situations and what goes into embargo and like just going halfway on that didn't seem like a great thing Uh, certainly Uh, so speaking of that we should probably talk about that kingdom yeah yeah i i got some really great news yesterday though yeah we were after we were done playing but i can't talk about it you'll hear about it in a few months on the podcast yeah i know i would i do know what he's talking about and he is indeed not allowed to talk about it but congratulations adam everybody congratulate adam for this thing that you don't know about. I'm um, really excited. Like, this is. is bucket list material right here. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, buckets of Dominion cards, uh, yeah. let's read this kingdom. You want to do it or should I? I got it. All right. So we have Embargo, Chariot Race, Improve, Golem, Mining Village, Remodel, Throne Room, Count, Ghost Ship, Royal Seal, Pathfinding, and Labyrinth. One more time for our audio-only listeners. Embargo. Chariot Race. Improve. Golem. Mining Village. Remodel. Throne Room. Count. Ghost Ship. Royal Seal. Pathfinding. And Labyrinth. Yeah, so it's no secret that Embargo is actually one of my favorite cards in the game, and uh, I think this kingdom does a 
decent justice to it. Like, every time... Like, for one thing, you definitely end up with embargoes in your deck because you have a bunch of zero cards, cards in your deck and you have remodels, so, like, incidentally, you're going to get the embargoes. Oh, yeah. uh, and also, uh, at a certain point, it being an action is important, right? Because uh, it can be thrown. Yeah. Or, in, well, not improved, but... Or, uh, yeah, um, etc. So... Uh, we had embargoes in our deck and there was always like some consideration sometimes you drew the embargo and it seemed like you and your opponent weren't about the same place and it was uh kind of really hard to make the call of what to embargo but most of the time there was some like aspect of well i've got plenty of draw right now so i'm gonna embargo the draw or uh he doesn't have any throne rooms and i have two i'm okay with just having two throne rooms and you embargo those so. Sure. So I think, uh, I mean, Embargo, I think, was the most fun <laughs> thing about this kingdom, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, like, the most important thing, right? It was it was just something that tactically came up and gave you an advantage if you played to it. Yeah, so there's no plus buy here, and that's important. Yeah. Uh, your other gains, aside from that, are limited pretty hard to remodel, which is the main one. But there's also Improve, which can gain you things, and then there's Count, yeah. which can gain coppers and duchies! Yeah. Which is the only way to really increase the size of your deck. Yeah, so you notice the Improve and the Remodel are card neutral. In you have to trash a card to gain a card, and the Count gaining is, like, terrible. Because uh, <laughs> you're gaining two, like, bad cards, except, um, you know, the, the Remodel food, at the very least. But the thing is, like, if you don't play Remodel, you're not going to get more than one province in a turn. Yeah. And there's always the threat of your opponent uh, very quickly embargoing the provinces. So having at least the ability and to, to go for Remodel as a big source of your payload uh, turns out to be very important. And, you know, going for Remodel as a big source of your payload is a pretty good thing to do here. Yeah. Uh, especially given that, I mean, in a lot of games we played, there were, like, six to eight or nine embargo tokens out like and that that's not person sucks that's not so much because we were like going for that it's because you ended up with the embargoes in your deck uh because you know either you had curses or you remodeled a copper or something or you had two and you didn't know what else to get yeah sure or uh you even had three and uh your deck was so action dense at that point that the embargo was you know better than the silver and the chariot races and improves were both embargoed right um so <laughs> yeah so like that actually happened uh uh so let's not let's not mislead when we're talking about this though i mean embargo we're talking about it because it was interesting that's what the episode was about that certainly wasn't the most important thing going on in this kingdom it was it was important but really uh the kingdom was kind of very much about pathfinding a mining village i'd say uh it seemed about like the early turns were about getting mining villages in the deck and then getting pathfinding on them so i'd say that's the main source of draw and the reason that's important is because of ghost ship Right. You can't really do something that doesn't invest heavily in draw because there's a threat of having a ghost ship played on you every turn, and that'll shut you down. Yeah, a ghost ship is not just a discard attack. It's a top-decking discard attack. So if you're hit with that subsequent turns, it's uh, much worse than if you were just hit with, like, militia subsequent turns or something. Yeah, I mean, you could get golem to hard counter it and skip <laughs> yeah. over those cards. None of us ever got a golem, so I don't think that i i never did did you ever get a golem no. at any point against wandering winter or anything no uh i i did play against the bot a couple times and the bot got a potion once nice but didn't okay. get a, didn't get a golem um yeah i got a potion to remodel it but really uh, i think at some point it happened everything else was embargoed uh but <laughs> yeah i don't remember this. so uh the it, it was interesting uh, I think I lost most of the games that we played of this, and a lot of it came down to something that surprised me. The most important card for hitting 8 on time to get your pathfinding in like a decently timely manner uh, was Throne Room, I'd say. Throne yeah. Room's a really good card. Yeah, I, I was like, why are you getting pathfinding two or three turns before me consistently? And all we could come back to is that you were putting Throne Rooms in the deck before I was. I was focusing more on uh, getting, you know, the mining villages themselves, on getting uh, a ghost ship, on, uh, you know, etc. 
Bye. Yeah, so uh, the, the, it kind of segues into this point. Uh, at the at the end of the last episode, I think we all agreed that an opening of Improve with Mining Village is probably the best you can do on 3-4. Yeah. And after playing, I, I think we sort of settled on that. Yeah. It's... Just about anything else you can do didn't really seem as good. I mean, uh, like, it's, yeah. The odds of not hitting 5 are super small with that opening, because there's just a lot of ways to do it. And depending on what those ways are, uh, if you didn't have to trash your mining village, and if you managed to get a 4 cost along with improving your improve into something... And then buying a four cost, if you were fortunate enough to have an estate miss the shuffle and, and get that distribution, um, then I think the four cost you put in, you know, you get your count, and then you put a remodel in the deck, and then a throne room in the deck. And it's already time to start getting throne rooms in the deck. Yeah, and I was kind of always kind of just basically scared to get the throne room because I didn't, th I thought I didn't have enough actions in the deck and I wasn't going to. Uh, really get value out of it. Uh, I was either going to draw it dead or draw it with something I wasn't super excited to throw in, but uh, it turns out it's really just the main way you're going to hit 8, and you kind of just have to take that risk uh, of not getting value out of your throne room, because if you don't, and the opponent does, they get pathfinding before you. Yeah. Right, so getting pathfinding with a couple of mining villages in your deck uh, is pretty strong play. <laughs> uh, it turns out, uh, at least in a mirror that uh, you really want to get a lot of mining villages and you really want to put pathfinding on them. And you really yeah. want to thin quickly with count. Part of the reason that you definitely need to get the mining villages in the mirror is so your opponent doesn't get too many mining villages. Yeah, yeah. pathfinding does that. It, it makes yeah. it so you want 10 of a thing, but you also don't want your opponent to get 10 of a thing. Right. So you go for the same thing and... Uh... I mean, you you could always, like, if... You could always say, screw it, I'll let you have ten of your thing and I'll go for a different thing. And that was viable here. You could pathfind throne rooms, you could pathfind chariot races. But the big problem is you're letting your opponent have ten of their things. So, like, that right. can be... You have to, like, be okay with not having, like, any of that thing and, like, your thing is just way better, but... Sure. I mean, I'm not super sad to be putting Pathfinding on Throne Room or Chariot Race. Yeah. But as it, I mean, you, you want to be putting Mining Villages in the deck early because uh, essentially they're cantrips and you can usually afford them. And that helps you line your count up with the things that you want to be trashing with it. And then it helps you line up your Throne Rooms with your count so you can hit eight and get your yeah. Pathfinding. Right. So um, the Mining Village is a good card in that respect. And now you already have a few of them in the deck, so you might as well slap the card token on it and sort... The the build just sort of logically takes you in that direction. Yeah, that's that's about what happened. So even though, in theory, you could certainly end up putting Pathfinding on Throne Room or Chariot Race instead, uh, that just ends up not being the deck that you... That just ends up not being your best move by the time you get to afford Pathfinding, because you probably have more Mining Villages in the decks. So. Uh, yeah, with that particular build in the mirror, it worked out that way. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised at the ghost ship not shutting that down, uh, but it didn't. Well, I mean, it doesn't shut it down, but if I am playing ghost ship on you regularly because I have pathfinding and you don't have a pathfinding yet, ghost ship is certainly a way for me to make your life more difficult until yes. you get your pathfinding. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the other thing is, like, the ghost ship attack can actually uh get, sometimes doesn't deny pathfinding uh like you would think it would because it lets them like just set up their next hand to spike pathfinding if you're not playing that ghost ship every turn hmm. so like normally getting that first ghost ship is is just good enough because you know you at least slow them down a little bit in this case you just uh delay them a turn to get pathfinding but they still get it mm -hmm. Uh, the last thing is, uh, both of the, the two of us had advocated for Chariot Race being an important source of VP. Yeah, uh, that was, that didn't... <laughs> in a mirror, it certainly didn't work out that way. The game is won and lost before that VP can really come into play. And that's mostly because of Ghost Ship and Embargo being ways for you to take an advantage and kind of compound on that. Um, yeah. I played a couple games against the bot. The bot's pretty terrible, but, um... You know, Chariot Race can be good there. I'm not sure that you really need it because you have Ghost Ship and Embargo. But, I mean, it's there. Yeah, I'm it's, not going to say that I was wrong in saying that Chariot Race could be important as a source of VP. But uh, it didn't work out that way in any of the games with human opponents. 
Yeah, and it's funny because normally I am the first person to like say, like, by the way, chart race is overrated. You don't always have to go for it. And then I was even advocating for it as an important source of VP here, but uh, I will say I was wrong. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, chariot race, uh, you sometimes bought it because it was a cantrip. Uh, yeah, and it cost three, and you couldn't get a mining village. Yeah. Mining village is a pretty good card. Yeah. Uh, so that's about all I have to say about this kingdom. What about you? Got nothing else. All right. It's gone. We're done with it. Rip that kingdom. Yep. We hardly knew you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this time, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about junking. And junking is a concept, of course, that we've talked about in the past. Uh, and this time we're going to f focus a little more on uh, conceptually, like, what junking does, what makes it so strong, and, and what kinds of roles junking actually plays in different games. Yeah, so um, what is junking? Yeah. Well, it's uh, giving your opponent cards that they don't want, Okay. basically. And, uh, I mean, we did actually, the episode before on uh, trashing and junking when there's both, which one do you go for first? And we talked a little bit about that in that case. Uh, but yeah. to so... recap... So, like, uh, curses are junk, obviously, and, uh, I mean, I have to take more than just my shirt off to come up with a scenario where I'm happy that you gave me a curse. Right. Yeah, and then, you know, there's the other ones, there's the ruins, and sometimes coppers and estates, and that kind of thing, and, um, it's not crazy to come up with situations where you want those, but it's kind of cold in here, so I'm gonna put my clothes back on. Yeah. Uh, there's, I mean, there's the idea that you can, like junk them with dead actions or sure uh, other treasures like oh a messenger is a thing and that thing is better for me than it is you and it's junking woo sure um i remember so i was play testing for adventures all right and uh messenger was uh, some form of it existed and it's close enough to what it is now yeah and uh, there was messenger and sea hag and my opponent went for sea hag and i'm like and let me let me just say this when I'm playtesting, I I try things that seem nuts, and... Usually they are. Usually they are, but if they're not terrible, you know, they need to be addressed. Right. Uh, and You're welcome I mean, that Silversmith doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. You can, you can thank Jake mostly for that, but uh, it was kind of a team effort, really. For sure, for sure. I mean, you were the one who like pointed out that that card was a problem, and then like, <laughs> all right, let's see about breaking it. <laughs> Turns out it was real easy, um, but yeah. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, anyway. So. But anyway, a messenger and sea hag. So my opponent opens a sea hag, and I just buy a bunch of messengers and give us both curses the whole game. <laughs> and let me tell you, I had more fun, but I also <laughs> lost horribly. <laughs> Yeah, and that's uh, that that tells you something about um, the playtesting process, and also just Adam's personality. Uh, but yeah, so uh, junking. Scholar scepter. Don't sleep on it, okay? Oh God. <laughs> so junking. Um, <laughs> so uh, this concept of junking, it implies that it's something you're doing to your opponent. It implies that uh, the junking is ha is like asymmetrical at the very least, right? Right, like yeah. if I'm if I'm talking about junking my opponent, I'm usually talking about like giving them junk that I'm not also getting. I I, I guess there's there's a couple of weird ones that that maybe junk you and them, but I mean those yeah. are and uh, they're still junkers. But I'm talking about junking as a verb. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? Like if I'm talking about junking somebody, I'm usually talking about like I'm not talking about buying messenger to give us both curses i'm what's, talking about what's wrong with that man <laughs> <laughs> if i watchtower in hand uh but there you yeah. go we did it uh, we did it messenger watchtower hashtag synergy jumping yeah. attack we did it. So, you know that that's actually more far-fetched than silver junking and let me just put on a few layers here yeah silver is not junk okay it's silver really, is a good card silver is junking is overblown and stupid it's not a thing. Okay. Uh, I'm going to agree with Adam for the most part that, like, silver junking is not a thing, but I do want to come back to it because uh, we're going to talk a little bit about basically what junking does to you, and 
I want to uh, then come back to the silver junking example. And okay, mostly... Well, as long as I still get to crap on it. When you, you do. do. Okay, you do. Uh, but So uh, <laughs> what, let's come back to that episode I referenced earlier. We talked about trashing and junking, and we were talking about your uh these these different muscles of debt control right oh and yeah you were saying and we were saying which one's stronger trashing or junking and you said in the abstract uh trashing's muscles are looking a little stronger than junking like when there's but, but junking has some great shoulders okay this is true yeah. so when there are junking options and there are trashing options and you can go for both uh and you you're choosing one to focus on or at least prioritize early usually you end up with trashing because the trashing ends up being a little better why is that though so, I mean, I think in most cases you end up with both, yeah. but you do the trashing first. Yes. And that's because uh, if you... And you prioritize it, too. Like, if you can only play one, you usually play your trasher. Uh, sure, if you only buy one, you buy the trasher first, and, and the same thing with playing them in a lot of yeah. cases. Uh, and I think that's because um, if I trash cards, that means I can play my good cards that I didn't trash more often. Yeah. So that includes the Junker, notably, but also um, my Trasher, so that I can accelerate this process and then maybe stay on top of Junks my opponent is handing me. That's true. So, like, if you look at, you know, these cards, uh, like this abstracted example where uh, I have this card that's trashing a card every turn, you have a card that's giving me a Junk every turn, um, you know, we're kind of coming out even, but your deck is never getting any thinner, whereas Shuffle Missing and what have you can make it so that I start to get a little thinner. Or you uh, just and then, buy another copy of the Trasher. Sure, exactly. And they can buy another copy of the Junker! <laughs> and eventually we'll get to this point where I'm seeing the card more often, and then that's sort of the critical mass point, where the trashing beats the Junking, quote-unquote. Uh, yeah, and, it, and like it doesn't always work out that way, but uh, I would say more often it goes that way than the other way, but like... But, you know, not always. Uh, there's something else at play here, though, that uh, leads to the uh, junking not necessarily uh, coming out as ahead as the trashing. And that comes down to, like, the cards that are actually doing the effect. Usually, junking attacks are things that uh, don't do a whole lot else, or the other thing they do is pretty weak for its cost. Like, we even think of one of the stronger junkers out there, which, medium which... Yes, medium witch. Uh, it's a terminal action that draws two cards. It's not a strong benefit. It comes with the junk as well. You can take that all the way down to more extreme examples like Sea Hag that does like absolutely nothing else. Uh, yeah, but the Sea Hag's not a good card. Right, so these cards that are junking, uh, they tend to not do a whole lot else, um, or the thing they do is weak. Uh, and the cards, there are not very many junking cards at all in the game that give out more than one piece of junk like per shuffle or per terminal action and those uh those stand out really as powerful junkers even like familiar and cultist uh just because they're the exception hmm. meanwhile you look at the cards in the game that trash and thin and those cards come with a variety of benefits that are that can be quite good for you on top of the trashing and thinning and uh trashing multiple cards per shuffle is relatively common in the game hmm. so i love trashing a lot of cards yeah, and yet, despite all of this, despite all of this context that leads us to believe the trashing is generally in the game stronger than junking, you still do go for the junking, like, most of the time it's available. Yeah, I think the the big exceptions to that are uh, something that we already did an episode about. Um, <laughs> sea Hag and Ill-Gotten Gains, we'll link to that uh, in the yeah, show notes. for sure. Um, we did record that episode before Nocturne was released, so there's Idol from Nocturne. I mean, yeah. Idol does a lot of things, and junking isn't really one of its main functions. Yeah, it's sure, the, Idol can junk. Idol is one of the more interesting junking attacks because you have to put two stop cards in your deck before you can start giving them one junk by lining both of them up. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's a lot of like Idol, Idol does other things a lot better than yeah. it does junking. It it does not fit the mold of what Jake is talking about here. Right. But it's I mean I don't look at Idol and I see a junking attack until I'm already thin. So I mean definitely the trashing is coming out ahead here. Yeah. So I think like it makes sense when we're thinking uh, when we're trying to answer this question of uh, do we go for this junking? Uh, how much? How important is it? And also. Um, like, what is the junk actually doing to the opponent? I think we should think about the things that 
the reasons we junk. What is what is junking actually manifest? So um, I remember on Goko, yeah, before you could turn off animations, if you played a witch, there was this purple cloud of smoke. I remember this. Yeah, it goes from the, the curse <laughs> cloud of your opponent's deck, so it's like farting on your opponent's deck. Oh my god. That's what junking does. You brought me back to that. That was yeah. amazing. I, uh, I miss Goko. Man, if you can find that animation, I hope we can put it in the YouTube software. video. quality yeah. software. Uh, I mean, I have some videos on the channel that have yeah. it. There's, there's a video entitled Farting on Your Opponent's Deck. Nice. Like, you can find that video. We'll link it in the, in the show notes. Yeah, so uh, in my mind, junking does two things. Uh, and these two things... Are farting? Yeah. Or that. Well, so these two <laughs> things are... Uh, so three things, apparently. Uh, pretty... <laughs> pretty easily uh, to uh, take a look at. They're related, but they uh, are distinct as well. And those are denying control and making your opponent's draws worse. Um, obviously, those are related, but uh, what do you what do you think when, you, when I talk about denying control? So it sounds to me like denying control means adding stop cards to the opponent's deck. Exactly. And then... And the uh, stop cards are bad, right? Well, they're stop cards. Now, if you're going to add silver to my deck, even though that's a stop card, yeah. silver's actually good, so that doesn't count. Sure. But I don't think this is where you wanted to talk about silver again. Well, I it, will hold in my... It's interesting. You know what. I am glad you brought up the silver, because the two things that the junking does are deny control and make your opponent's draws worse. Oh, and obviously yeah. those are uh, connected, but dry, denying control... I'm talking about slowing down their shuffling so they see their uh, new cards and their good cards less often. I'm talking about get, putting more cards in their life so that they don't line up two particular cards like Village and Smithy or Tournament and Province, things like that. Um, and making their draws worse is simple. They're just drawing the junk instead of a better card, right? So uh, they're getting like a curse which doesn't do anything they're getting ruins that don't do anything they're uh getting coppers in their money deck when their money density was more than one so that's, that's junk in that case so this also has a compounding effect because let's say i play my medium witch i give you a purple and then you draw the purple right you're gonna have to draw that purple once every shuffle but whenever you draw the purple you're going to have a worse hand yeah. than if you did to have the purple. So it, let's say you're going to buy a worse card because you had a worse hand. And so now the shuffle after that, you not only have this purple, but you have maybe another purple I gave you because I played my medium witch again. And you also have a worse card in your deck because of the initial purple. So right. so all of, this, all of these effects are growing. They're compounding on each other every time you shuffle your deck. Uh, which is uh, a lot of the reason why you want to be going for the junking early on so that this compounding effect can, can happen. And if available, why you want to start trashing these cards because that can get rid of, you know, not only having that curse at that one point in time, but it prevents you from drawing it again and then having all the compounding crap that I just talked about. Exactly. Uh, so we've got these two different... Uh effects that are sort of the driving force behind what makes junking powerful uh, denying that control which can be quite good and making the draws worse um, and identifying which thing you're leaning on which thing is more important can kind of s help you identify uh, good junking effects in the kingdom and, and whether or not your opponent is quote unquote weak to junking uh, things like that to try to get an advantage like if you are uh, really trying to rely on denying them control, uh, then Soothsayer becomes a really bad junking attack, right? Because you're making your draws way better. You're getting a gold and they're getting a curse, but you're both putting stop cards in your deck. You're both actually losing the same amount of control. Uh, so, like, uh, the trying to identify why you're junking them, what you're trying to accomplish with it, can definitely help you value those junking attacks properly. Yeah, so, like, some of the junking attacks, all they do is junk your opponent. Yeah. Then there's stuff like Soothsayer, which can... I'm not going to say that adding a gold to your deck is junking you, because that's no. definitely not true. It's not. I mean, it increases the quality of your draw so much that, uh, you know, it's going to be worth it, unless yellow equals purple, which we did a whole episode on, 
link in the show notes. Yeah. But uh, there's there's even other different types of attacks. Like um, I'm thinking about Swindler, where I play sure. the card and I'm not necessarily going to be changing the number of stop cards in your deck, but I'm just decreasing the quality of those draws. So if I if I play Swindler, turn your copper into a curse. Uh, yeah. You still have the same number of stop cards, but that effect is devastating, right? Yeah. That's a huge blow to your economy, and, you know, that has that compounding effect, as, as I talked about before. So, like, you know, these, these effects can be divorced, or they can be together. Uh, the important thing is that we're all together yes. in, in Dominion, in, in life. life. And we're drinking enough water. And thank you. Um, I've, like, yeah. had, I've chugged, like, two of these glasses since before, and then I had, like, a whole milkshake before that. I'm thirsty, man. I'm thirsty... Nice. For Dominion. And strategy. Yeah, okay, so Swindler is also interesting because, like, sometimes Swindler will trash your opponent's cantrips and turn them into stop cards, and that's where it gets weird, but I think you purposely avoided that example because it's hard to talk about. That's that's more um, like adding the effect of a trashing attack yeah. along with potentially uh, a junking attack, but uh, let's be real here. If uh, you turn my cantrip into a silver, that's no longer junking, but if you turn my pearl diver into an estate... That's quite chunking. Then I'm gonna need some ice cream for that sick burn. Ask me, ask me what flavor. <laughs> anyway, I've no, seen that movie. Don't. I've seen the movie. Okay, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so like, you you know, another extreme example. We talked about how Soothsayer is a good junking attack to make your draws better than your opponent's draws. Bad junker to try to deny control with. Uh, and then, on the other hand, Ambassador is, like, on the flip side, right? Because Ambassador is really bad for the hand that you draw it in. It is turning your, like, $3 hand into a $1 hand, or it's it's decreasing your hand size by, like, 3-ish on a good day. But the reason that that's good uh, is because you're levering such a control advantage on the opponent. So thinking about uh, which effect of the junking is actually important is... Uh, key to evaluating why you're junking is key to uh, making good decisions about junking. In Ambassador's case, you play one card one time, and not only are you hopefully thinning cards from your deck, but you are also junking. Oh, and followers... So that's, a, that's a twofer. Yeah, followers as a junking attack is really good at doing neither one of those things and helping you tread water for a little bit while your opponent catches up. Followers is overrated. Next... I mean, followers um, is a <laughs> discard attack more than anything. Yeah, followers else, right? is a discard that's, attack. That's yeah, what I that know. card's good for. That's true. I know so much about tournament yeah. prizes. <laughs> uh, so, as we're looking at these different things that you know, junking accomplishes for you, uh, the turn by turn significance of junking uh, over the course of a shuffle, uh, we can also take a look at junking zoomed out and like look at what the junking is doing over the course of the game. Right, and there are like three situations that I would put boards that have junking in. Three situations. That's like the three seashells, right? Exactly. Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, we. Uh, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how much junking uh, ends up mattering, right? Uh, well, does junking matter? Yeah, of course it does. Like, yeah. how's that even a question, right? Uh, <laughs> Well, but, like, how much how much does it matter? I mean, I've, I've talked about the priorities you have and the talk of the, at, the, at the at the beginning of the game. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, thinning and junking are number one on the list, and, and they share that spot uh, because, you know, they, they sort of have the opposite effect when you, when you consider what happens to your opponent's deck, blah, blah, blah. Um, you you kind of need to incorporate this uh, pretty much all the time uh, if it's available, with the exceptions that we talked about, you know, the Sea Hag, the Egg, the Idol. Yeah, and then, you know, that junking at the beginning of the game, the trashing and the thinning, that characteristic they're sharing is the control one, right? That That's kind of where they lean. A lot of the times, that's the case, yes. Yeah. Um, if you, so, like, if, you, if you're looking at a card and you see, what is this card good for, and, and that's junking your opponent, then, like... Unless it's one of these exceptions or, like, really weird edge cases beyond the scope of what we're talking about. Like, junking needs to be an important part of your strategy. And and I'm not just saying, oh, well, I thin my deck down, and then I buy the junker, and then I play the junker. 
Well, he might be saying that, though. That what? sounds like a decent strategy, actually. Right, I'm uh, not the... <laughs> only saying that. That's right. not where this ends. Yeah. Because, um, first of all... So, like, there's the abstract case of, oh, I'm going to play big money, and big money doesn't care about trashing its coppers because it's not worth the effort, right? Yes. Um, but... but if there's a junking attack around and I don't trash my coppers, then I'm going to have a lot of trouble lining up my trasher with the curses that I need to trash. Well, so I'm more vulnerable to junking. It's actually really interesting that you say that because you could also think about uh, a big money like that's facing a copper junker. And like we talked about how big money doesn't really care about trashing its coppers. It just doesn't do it if there's like any opportunity cost. That's not to say it doesn't care about gaining coppers. Like gaining mm. extra coppers hurts big money quite a bit because it lowers your money density. Sure, I would consider trashing coppers in my big money deck if I knew I was going to be junked with coppers. Yeah, for sure. Like, so that actually matters in that case. Yeah, so, I, I mean, yeah, you're going to need to be trashing more than you otherwise would. And in some cases, uh, doing trashing you wouldn't do because of the junker, making sure you can stay on top of it. But also, like, let's say, that, you know, there's another scenario. Let's say uh we're both building this deck and that deck aims to draw itself or come close to it you know you want to you want to get almost complete control over your deck so you start out you get some trashers you thin your deck down and now your deck is starting to do good things it's getting to all its good cards every turn and uh, its output is pretty dece and now it's time maybe i should consider getting my junker yeah. So, um, you know, there's a number of things that can happen. First of all, it's, it's just important to know, um, first of all, two things. Number one, how vulnerable is your opponent's deck to junking? Are they drawing everything, including the curses that you gave them, and able to trash the junks without any additional effort? If that's the case, then, you know, maybe the junker's not worth your time. But if it's they're... It's not to say it's definitely not, though. Right, but but if any of that doesn't hold, then then they are vulnerable. Yeah, even if what it does is make them double down on their resources to uh, then keep draw, to draw more because you're junking them and then trash that, uh, you're still slowing them down, right? Right, that's an important point. They uh, then can't focus on building in other ways, right? They have to deal with this threat that you're posing. Yeah, they have to sidestep, and then also you're gonna build that deck differently. Because let's let's say you know we we get to this point where we built up our payload and no one's gotten the junking attack because they decided oh well they can deal with it too easily, but at a certain point you have to buy green cards. Yes. Put the green cards in your deck. That's like junking yourself. Well, it is. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so once you get to that point, you start to lose that full deck control, and now all of a sudden, your deck is vulnerable to junking. Yeah. So you either have to overbuild so that that doesn't happen or make it so you can green fast enough that they can't react, get the junker, play the junker in enough time to slow you down and have it mean anything. A lot of the time you see on boards that have a junking attack, you green later, even in like single game games like that. You green later just because uh, there's always a threat that you could they could counter your greening by starting to junk you and then denying you green cards later. Yeah. So, like, all of this stuff is pushing you in the direction of building more. In yeah. the beginning of the game, you're building more because you're going to focus more on trashing. But then in the middle to the end game, you're going to be building more because you want to focus more on drawing more. Yeah, staying consistent. Yeah. So, all right. We, I, I think that any board where there's junking and where junking is decent, right? I'm not talking about the boards where junking is a bad idea, but... Uh, I'm talking about the three things that junking uh, can be doing to your opponent uh, that I call the three f*** yous of junking. Oh, so it's not the three seashells. Yeah, it's the it's the three f*** yous. The three f*** yous. Yeah. Okay, so this, this first situation is uh, <laughs> where the purpose of the junking is to deny them control forever because f*** you. Because f*** you. Right. Yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is uh, the board that a lot of people think of when they think of like a junking attack being powerful there's no trashing or the trashing is uh slow or unreliable compared to the junk that sounds like it fucking sucks yeah it does fucking does <laughs> so like the the 
the junking in this case is obviously extremely uh, centralizing when you're dealing with like uh, sea hag and no trashing or like there's familiar out and all you've got is like sacrifice or exorcist but they're hitting you with cultists stuff like that stuff that's too slow to handle the junk remember when i said that trashing was really really important in these games yeah well when you can't trash or not trash enough uh like you can it sucks it does <laughs> yeah so the uh that's the most extreme case and the junking is is really centralizing and the idea behind the junking in this case is that it eventually makes your opponent's draws worse forever because they can't deal with the junk and they're constantly drawing it instead of better stuff and they're not buying as good of stuff etc yeah. now again i want to stress that the long-term effect of this is that their draws are now worse they have less money in them or, or less stuff going on so uh, we're not talking about silver again, uh, but silver's great yeah. there. It's f great. Yeah, in these cases, uh, you end up talking a lot about the junk splits. Like you'll you'll end up talking about the curse split or the ruin split a lot of the time, and uh, you uh, go for the junking, but you also prioritize it over. Uh, like doing anything else you prioritize cycling to your junker or mm. uh, buying an extra copy of your junker if it like costs five or something uh, so like the junking is very much top priority until the junk is gone in these cases and that's you f- number one yep yeah yeah uh so there's a there's another uh aspect uh, oh by the way uh Given that that's as strong as junking is, like that's kind of the only time that you'll see certain junkers like even be competitive, right? Like, like, like which one? I'm talking about like Sea Hag, right? Like things oh, like yeah. Sea Hag and Marauder. Like, yeah. um, a lot of the time, like that's the only time that like certain junkers see play because they do so little for you on your own turn that uh, it needs to be that sort of forever. Or, f- you. I think that uh, I think that's where Messenger plus Watchtower fits in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Messenger plus Watchtower. Uh, I would combo. say idle, except even idle's kind of bad in that situation. Well, let's say like, instead of a messenger, you got an idle. And then instead of a watchtower, you got another idle. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. Now, you've, you've got the two idols, and those can be good cards for your deck. Anyway. Yeah, uh, because so there's silver, and silver is a good card. I think of idle more like gold, but... Um, well... Yeah, two, two that's even better numbers. than silver. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but, wow! So, uh, yeah, then, then we have this other uh, yeah. kind of board yeah. where uh, the idea is not to deny control forever, it's to deny control temporarily and slow you down because f*** you. <laughs> uh, so the idea so here... So instead of like taking a giant steaming crap all over your deck... You're more like just like depositing a turd every once and again, and then they clean it off. Is that right? But they have to do that. Yeah, and that's the idea. The idea is that you've got uh, both junking resources and thinning resources, or, or something to deal with the junk. Uh, and the junking in this case is not so much of a permanent defect that you're causing to your opponent's draws. It's a temporary state of affairs. You're not making their draws worse forever. You're uh, temporarily denying them that control. And uh, the idea is that uh, if you force them to draw the junk at least once to trash it, it's like they didn't get to draw another card that they would have. So that's uh, where I think I'm actually glad that Renaissance came out so we can talk about things like Old Witch is I think like the best example of this. Because uh, even without other trashing in the kingdom, like Old Witch and kind of lends itself to trash that. Trash the curses, kind of yeah. Yeah. But you drew the curses in the meantime. So it's you, like... you still get the old witch. It's still good. I yeah. promise. Yeah. So the emphasis here uh, is still to go for the junking uh, because, again, like Adam mentioned earlier, uh, the opponent can be weak to it. And uh, so in these situations, you can kind of threaten to force them into something closer to that first situation we were talking about mm. if they don't respect the junker. Sure. Enough. Hashtag uh, respect the junker. Hashtag respect the junker. Uh, but the uh, when the junking and the trashing are both kind of like uh, button heads with each other, that's kind of what I'd call uh, the role of junking is just this temporary slowdown. I had this image in my head of like two very, you know, 
muscular men without shirts on. Yeah. So if they're going to be competing with each other, can they be, like, bumping their pecs into each other or something? Yeah, this kind of went to a weird place, Adam, and if you want to talk about it later, we can. Uh, but We'll talk about it later. Yeah, so uh, what do you, what, and what's the significance of this? Like, how, do, how does this affect, how does identifying this situation help you? And I think that, for one thing, you're not uh, doing those things that I focused on earlier. Like, you don't, like, find yourself talking about the junk splits in those situations. Like, mm. when... When the curses are going to get trashed, I don't find myself worrying about who got six and who got four, right? Yeah, I mean, it matters, but not nearly as much. I find myself focusing on other things instead. Like, can I buy the card I want? Or, it's like, not... maybe counting, which is really hard. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to prioritize cycling to my witch versus buying a whatever. Card. Yeah. Like yeah. a witch. Like yeah. a silver. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... Then there's this third situation where you do end up uh, focusing on junking as well. And uh, this is the other extreme. Uh, and that's where the junk is easily dealt with, easily, I put in quotation marks. And the role of the junking attack is to make you use your trasher more. Uh, because <laughs> fuck you. Uh, this is uh, the case when there is like really strong thinning or trashing. Or uh, maybe the junking is really weak, but it was also, like, good to have in your deck in the first place. Like the, the Soothsayer example or something, or Idols. Yeah. Um, where, like, the junking is slow compared to the trashing, but the effect of the junking is that they have to use that trasher. Like, any any junking at all when donates out is uh, can be a good example. Yeah, donates seem like the prime example of this. Yeah. Because it's like, donate is now converting trashing any number of cards into an economic effect right so if i'm gonna junk you then the way you deal with that is by spending money in a buy on it as opposed to yeah. playing a card that trashes or building your deck in a certain way i like a lot of the time the idea that i made you spend a debt get take a debt and spend a buy slows you down more than it slowed me down to get the junker so that still means yeah. that i get the junker in that case but i do need to be aware of the role that it's playing and mm -hmm. not focus on it too much right it's like to slow you down half a turn at most yeah or yeah roughly eight debt yeah and one buy uh, the other time this is viable is when the trasher is good but it's like terminal right yeah uh, and like especially when there's no, like, abundance of villages or something. You'd rather play something else, but now you have to spend an action playing your chapel or whatever. Yeah. No uh, one likes spending an action to play their chapel. Yeah, the, the that's, junk... That's for noobs. Yeah. Get rid of my coppers. I'm done with this. Yeah. Why do I need to keep playing this chapel? Because... I put it on my island mat. I'm done with this. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, I got an Rip. island. But, yeah, <laughs> uh, the, um... Hey, you island the chapel, hello! Uh, so... Yeah, the effect of the Junker in that case was, like, minus one action or whatever. Uh, the effect of the Junker was that they didn't get to play some payload action or something. Yeah. Yeah. Sucks, man. Yeah. And F you. Yeah. F you. <laughs> so, uh, we went through these, these three different situations uh, where the Junking is playing different roles, and those all affect how you prioritize it and the kinds of things you uh, focus on. Yeah. We yeah. did it. Did it. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of me. I'm proud of us. Proud of Lexi. I'm proud of Lexi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She did a great job of laying on the floor. Look at her. She's still doing it. Yep. I'm not going to move the webcam. I'm too lazy. And now she's excited because we're talking about her. Hi, doggo. She's ready to hear about a kingdom with a junker in it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I should probably read that, I guess. Yeah. Do it. Uh, okay, so... This kingdom has some cards in it. I'm going to read those. Um, let's see. Where do I start? Let's start in the middle and work our way outwards. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. We start with uh, Alchemist, Oasis, Scheme, Devil's Workshop, Bazaar, Explorer, Festival, Mandarin, Market, Medium Witch, and we also have the event Trade. Uh, once more for our audio-only listeners, we have Alchemist, Oasis, Scheme, Devil's Workshop, Bazaar, Explorer, Festival, Mandarin, Market, 
Witch, and the event Trade. So there is junking here, yep. and there is trashing here. Good old medium witch. But there's no thinning here. Yeah, you can't really decrease the number of cards in your deck. So the junking does deny control for whatever that's worth, and you, like, is that important? Well, so so here's the thing. Um, I've played games where trade serves as uh, like a hard counter to junking attacks. It's call it a medium counter. Like for medium witch. Yeah, I'd call it a, a rough counter. Not a hard uh, counter. It's not I'm a gonna soft stick counter. with medium counter. All right, medium counter. I don't. Yeah. So okay. So like I I can see this idea of. My opponent plays Witch on me, but I now have these purples and I trade them. And I'm not going to say that I'm definitely better off in this situation, but I'm certainly not sad that that exchange happened. So you're not better off at all uh, because, I mean, you... you I'm not pinched for gains, right? I can buy more cards if I want to. Sure. You got the... You had to... uh, draw you you had to get the five dollar hand and have the curses and then you had to spend a five dollar buy to turn those curses into the silvers and the old witch is adding stop cards to your deck so medium witch the the medium witch is adding stop cards to your deck uh that you're not going to be able to get rid of so if you care about that um and you might uh with the deck that we're looking at here uh you know that could be a problem also uh you know how I just said that you uh, have these these two junk cards and a five dollar hand uh, to set up a really good trade. Yeah. You know, the card looks really good for that. Medium Alchemist. witch. Oh. Because <laughs> uh, like medium witch, yeah, it does. Yeah, it helps a lot with that. Yeah. So like, I think that uh, you're both. I think like you're gonna go for the junking here for sure, uh, because also the the medium witch is just the plus cards is enough of a effect that you'd want to go for. So itself. I'll tell you what I'm thinking about. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that Witch makes me want to go for Alchemist. Where if Witch wasn't here, I'm not sure that I would be going for Alchemist. Alchemist is, uh, you know, it's high cost. Costs a potion. And it can be a trap frequently. But it certainly can. Being able to have that uh, somewhat consistent draw in a deck with no way to thin is important for making sure that I can find curses in hands that have enough money to get a trade so I can stay on top of it. It's also important for um, potentially finding my wish and playing that more often if my opponent builds a deck that's vulnerable to it. And I don't think that there's a deck you can build here that isn't vulnerable to being jumped in any way. No, the junking is something you can uh, certainly deal with. But the, especially because the Junker itself is a decent enough card with plus two cards on it, uh, you're, you're certainly not better off because your opponent got the Junker. Right. Uh, so I think this just goes to show that Junking is really good. Yeah. And it's uh, very seldom that you skip it just because uh, even though it can be dealt with, um, you know, your opponent's still probably worse off. Like, you're going to make me get this potion go for these alchemists when otherwise I might be able to just build a deck that greens a little faster and can get the job done that way. Sure. Uh, that deck still might work out, though, because, I mean, Explorer is pretty good for it. Uh, I don't know. If you don't invest in a way to consistently yeah. find your curses and, and, uh, and, and, and trash them, them, then my deck that cycles back to its witch that, that is able to find its witch more often because it's drawing more cards, yeah. that's the only way to do it, uh, that deck is going to give you a lot of curses, and you're going to have to have... I mean, you're going to be more vulnerable to that. I mean, so even if you trade all of them into... Uh, let, let's say, like, best-case scenario, you trade all of those curses into silvers, uh, I mean, making you spend uh, five... Five dollar buys on ten silvers seems fine. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's certainly not the worst thing. I think I would uh, on a three four. I would open potion oasis. Uh, I don't know if I care enough about alchemist that early to go for it right off the bat. I I mean, there's something to be said for opening so that you prioritize hitting five to get the witch. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So, I like, got the alchemist early, man. 
Uh, okay, so I am looking at a few things. I am looking at wanting to hit five to get the witch, so I'm looking at, uh, like, I, I would probably rather go Silver Oasis than Silver Silver. Um, I'm also... The Devil's Workshop is a card that I would like to have, and it's not a card that I feel like I can afford to open with because, again, I need to hit five to get the witch, but having the D-Works uh, is, is quite good once I uh, am getting those trades where I'm gaining two silvers to get an imp. Uh, it's decent enough on the in the early game to gain a gold uh, instead of a three to four cost. So... Oh, man, I, th I still think you can't really afford to open with it for that purpose, just because you need to get the witch if you're not hmm. immediately going to start driving con contesting alchemists. Uh, yeah, but I, I like going for the witch before the alchemists, and then going for the alchemists a little bit later. There you go. There's your disagreement. Oh, uh, we should probably talk about what you're building too, right? Like, what's this, what's this deck doing? Um, uh, the deck I want to build plays a buttload of alchemists. And uh, plays maybe a market or two, and I've... buys good cards. Probably has All two right. potions. Uh, yeah, so uh, markets and festivals both seem good to me. Uh, partially, I'm talking about the festivals because I don't know that I'm as warm on Alchemist as you are. Uh, I mean, you, you might you be You would right. get festival over Bazaar? Bazaar uh, seems like a... Oh, yeah, if I'm going to have markets in the deck. Never mind, the festival's dumb. Uh, so yeah, uh, the uh, the bazaars and the markets. I mean, I think you want more than two markets, just because like there's no real incentive to start like greening or putting stop cards in the deck when these value cantrips are around. Like it's not really it's not really slower to just get a bunch of them. And really, your payload that way. Yeah, you're I mean, just at not... some point you buy victory cards. Yeah, at some point, sure. But like I think that that point is uh, usually when you've like markets and bazaars are probably pretty low at that point because both you and your opponent have built into a lot of them don't, don't... you tell me what i'm gonna do no i mean i i'm certainly not saying that it has to go that way like you can pressure your opponent into greening early but i think you're usually worse off for doing that just because like double province doesn't seem that crazy here yeah um, especially if you have a lot of silvers in your deck well or you're traded a lot get, yeah markets too yeah man yeah yeah yeah. Uh, so, that's that. Yeah, so uh, do you think you would go for Alchemist first, or do you think you'd go for Witch first? Would you go for Alchemist at all? Would you when would you be getting the D-Works and uh, the Devil's Workshop? And uh, if so, uh, when would you be getting it? I'm thinking I want the Devil's Workshop probably on turn three or four. When it, Second shuffle on the hand that I don't get my Witch. I hope I hit four. Uh, if it works out that way, I would consider getting the D-Works. Especially because it's uh, not a terminal, and I have that drawing terminal in my deck that's the witch. Yeah. Like, I can draw the D-Works dead, and it's fine. Right. I'm just trying to think if I couldn't get it on turn 3 or turn 4. I'm trying to think if I would bother getting it at all. Well, it's going positive. Oh, man. It's going to... So, like, even in the bad case... Uh, where it can't gain an imp, or like it's it's not getting a you can gain schemes, and like you want schemes in the deck for your witch, like yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean like gaining uh, gaining schemes along with that one or two witches. Actually, that leans me even farther away from going for alchemist early. Yeah, because like if I if I'm scheming my witches, I feel like I'm gonna junk you pretty quickly for having spent time on alchemist. Hmm. But. Uh, you can turn the silver. The alchemist helps you set up good trades. So, yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, you can holler at us in the uh, comment section on YouTube if you are a video listener, or you can head on over to adamhorton.com. There's a bunch of links to a lot of places, the forums, the Discord, uh, our contact info. Uh, we want to hear from you, see what you think on this kingdom. How wrong am I? And I, I mean, it turns out the Mandarin split is yeah. OP here. Yeah, you gotta top deck that potion. Yeah, so that you get can... those Mandarins. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, top decking the witch with Mandarin is basically the same thing as scheming it. Yeah, it's really good. Um, same effect. Yep. You got $3. Nice. Nice. Yeah. 
So yeah, let us know what you think, and uh, we will, you know, be back next week for another episode. It might even be on time. Who knows? Yeah, <laughs> one can hope. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Yeah. It's loud, so we have to talk loud, but now it's kind of fading out. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Usually, this is where they get like an Easter egg or something. Yeah. So she'll probably do an Easter egg. I don't know when the what the Easter egg's gonna be. It's probably gonna be something like right before we started recording the episode. It ends with the intro of the episode or something like that. Yeah, that's usually what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Why mess with a good thing? Yeah. I should probably get more water. Don't say anything to the camera that would embarrass me or anything like that. Hi, Mr. Kitty. accidentally used the word engine the other day. Yeah, we were just talking about a deck. The build and wasn't anything else to call it. Hey Adam. Hey, what's up? How's it going? Ah, oh, not too bad. Nice.